Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Albright's Fashion <coughs> Discovery Series. My name is Doreen Berdowski, and I have the honor of being the chair of the fashion department at Albright. This event is a collaboration of our Center for the Arts, the admissions department, and also the fashion department at Albright. And the focus of the series is to educate current and prospective students on career possibilities in the fashion industry. Please feel free to put your questions in chat and I will make sure that they're relayed to our speaker. Okay. Um, tonight's guest is Scott French. Scott graduated from Albright in 1987. Um, and he has had, I have to say, an amazing career path with many twists and turns. Um, but I'm gonna let him provide you with the details. So Scott, you wanna take over? Well, that was a, a, a very short introduction. <laughs> I was expecting a longer, tell more of that story. Yeah, no, uh, to say that my uh, career path has been circuitous, circuitous is a, is a gross, gross understatement. But first off, let me say thank you for having me. It's always a joy to do things with, um, with you especially and Albright in general. So um, feel free to ask any questions. Nothing's off limits. Um, I literally mean that. I spend my entire day talking and answering questions and posing questions of others. So I'm very adept at it. Nothing can throw me. So um, I guess we'll just start at the beginning. I came to Albright in, um, in a, uh, you know, not really wanting to go to Albright, believe it or not. I, I was a, it was weird. I thought I wanted to go to Penn State University, but I graduated high school when I was 16 years old. So Penn State wouldn't accept me. Um, and as a result of them not accepting me to the main campus, I'm like, as is any, true of anything in my life, when someone throws a, a barrier down, I simply look at it, laugh, and walk around it. So I, I sought other um, educational opportunities, and Albright presented itself um, through a, a, a long story. But anyway, I found, I found my way to, the board, to Albright via the Board of Trustees. And I started out as a chemistry major, believe it or not. And I um, was really enjoying chemistry, thought that was my dream. It was going to go into um, medical research or medicine. I had no, really no idea that something in the medical field in some way. But I had this lab partner, Kim Doyle was her name, and her roommate was April Holly. And April Holly was what I thought was an interior design major. And I would end up going up to Kim's room to work on our, our lab work in, in her room, and I would rush through my lab work so that I could go over and help April with her interior design um, presentation boards. And I was like, and April was excelling um, in her interior design projects because I was helping her out with it. And I, and I was excelling in, in my interior design acumen. But I realized that um, I really enjoyed this creative side of things and chemistry wasn't going to provide that. So one night I came to New York City um, with a friend and we ended up in, in some nightclubs and I was surrounded by this environment for the first time I experienced like a New York City nightclub as Dance Interior was the name of the club. And I still remember there were two things that happened that night. One, Madonna was mixing the music that night. And there was this guy in the back of the room painting on the wall. And it was happened to be Keith Haring. Um, and I thought to myself, for the first time, I thought, oh, my God, this is an unbelievable experience. I've got to figure out how I can get here as fast as I can. New York was, I, I, I answered the calling, if you will. It was calling my name. And I came back to um, Albright. and. Though I was doing well in chemistry, I wasn't, it wasn't fulfilling me. I thought, you know what I want to be? I thought, if I could design interior design work, uh, you know, buildings, I could move to New York faster. So I went across the uh, way. I took my organic chemistry final at the end of my sophomore year. I walked out of Science Hall in the back door to the, uh, I think it was, is it Master's Hall? Not Master's, Master's Hall? Alumni. Alumni Hall. Alumni, alumni Hall. <laughs> alumni Hall. Walked in the back door of Alumni Hall, and I walked into, a, a, at the time, the chair of the department, your, one of your predecessors, Connie Horacek, and said, I want to become a, a fashion interior design major. And Connie looked at me and says, well, we'd love to have you, dear. She called everybody dear. But there's one problem. I said, what's that? She said, well, we don't have an interior design major. That's part of a fashion um, degree, fashion degree. And I'm like, okay, then fashion's what it is. I literally came to fashion in that manner at the end of my sophomore year. And over the next two years, I you know, struggled through classes, got all the way through classes and managed to get it all done by going around the clock, taking extra coursework, et cetera. And I graduated with a degree in fashion merchandising and design. Um, and I moved to New York right away and realized my dream of working in a retail establishment. That's what I thought I wanted to do. So I got a job at Banana Republic, right across the street from Bloomingdale's. And I reported to work on June 16th at eight o'clock in the morning. I remember thinking 
while I, I finally arrived and around 11 o'clock that day, I realized like this is a horrendous career path for me. Like I can't possibly imagine spending the next, you know, you know, 40 years of my life in retail. Um, but then along, along came Friday and an amazing thing happened. A paycheck came my way and I call it reversing the cash flow. So I realized like, okay, for once someone's paying me to do something, it's not such a horrible job, but I know it's not in my future, but at least now I have, um, you know, a paycheck and I'm in the city I want to be in. So over the next year, year and a half, I built my you know, career in retail. I was working my way up the ranks at Banana Republic, but an amazing thing happened. I befriended the design director of Banana Republic. The design studios were very near the store. And I, um, her name was Tasha Polizzi. I still keep in touch with her actually. She has a store near me here in, in Connecticut. And I befriended her and said, can I come by the design studios? And I went by, investigated this whole, and was in love with the whole supply side, if you will, of fashion. And I realized like this is really a, a, an amazing experience. And through my work with Natasha, um, I realized like I was a better salesperson in the stores because I understood the background of the, of the collection. And I also knew that someday I'd be a better designer if I ever go that route because I understood how the sales, I understood the, the, the connections were made. So I realized I wasn't wasting my time. I was actually building my skill set. So um, over the next few years, We'll fast forward a few years, I was um, I realized like I really wanted to be on the design side of things. I tried to do that with Banana Republic. It wasn't going to happen. Um, our my boss at the time was a guy named Mickey Drexler, who went on to be own J Crew and and you know went on to be a legend in the industry. But Mickey would not allow cross uh, departmental moves. You were either retail or you were design side. So I said screw this. I'm going to become a designer. So I realized I had this idea and I had this you know desire to have my own collection in some way. So my girlfriend at the time, classmate at Albright at the time, Jennifer Buckley was her name. We sort of put our heads together and said, what can we do to you know, have our own collection? Because she too shared my, my dream and passion. We got this idea to make um, women's underwear, novelty women's underwear. And we built a, or we, we launched a company called um, Betty Wear was the name of the company. And over the next few years at Betty Wear, um, she was, um, she and I built this company up. She did most of the design work. I did most of the sales work and we launched this company and we ended up building it up to about a million and a half dollars over the next, um, in about two and a half years, we had a million and a half dollars a year. And that seems like a significant amount of money, but really it's not. When you're living in New York, um, putting every dollar back into the company, it didn't make a lot of money for us at all, but it showed us that this is what we really wanted to do. And we realized that our, our issues were with the production side of things. We, weren't, we had like Bloomingdale's, we had Saks Fifth Avenue, we had Macy's, all these stores wanting us, but in order to get out in, in all the stores in a big way, something had to change with the supply side. So we needed to seek import experience because we couldn't do that doing it domestically. So we ended up sort of going out of business with that company because we realized that the noose was around our neck, but through connections in the industry, and that's a common theme in everything that's ever been done in my career is all through connections. Um, I hark back to when I was at Albright, we were sitting around as a seniors and we we're sitting around the table like that was really hard. You know, I worked really hard to get my degree and my friends, oh, I really worked hard to get that presentation done. I remember a couple of my friends who are on this tonight, my roommates actually on this thing right now, um, looked at me and said, and yes, Scott, you had all of us working hard for you. And that was an inside joke. Like I've always been able to rally the troops around me and get people to do things for me and you know, work it to my advantage in some way. So I utilized some connections and I found an importer and exporter who gave me a chance and gave us a chance at launching a new company with his production behind us. And all of a sudden in the next three years, we took this company called French Jenny. It was the French and she was the Jenny. We built it up from one and a half million dollars a year to about 9 million a year over the next three years. So it was a really big increase in business. But what we realized was the power of the global sourcing the power of the importing and exporting model and that we traveled the world, we sourced fabrics, sourced production all over the planet and really sold globally. Um, and while we were happy doing that, Jennifer was ecstatic doing that, I was happy doing that, I realized that my real calling was the runway. I wanted to be on the runways. I wanted to have my own sportswear collection. I wanted them under my own label. Um, I had some friends of mine who are now sort of household names in the industry, but we were all sort of you know, growing up at the time building our, our presence and I want to do what they were doing. 
So I saw the opportunity to leave and I left and founded my own label, R. Scott French. And I launched a menswear collection on the runways. Um, and I showed the next 10 seasons um, on the runways and in my own collection. Um, Jennifer stayed on with um, French Jenny and she stayed on just till recently, actually. She just left that job not long ago. But you know, she had found her passion, but I hadn't yet. I found mine on the runway. So I went over to the runways and launched, as I said, showed my collection. And I realized it was an amazing race, but it was also an insane rat race as well. Um, one day I was backstage after this, you know, pouring my heart out in the runway show, had all this insane media around me and all the cameras going on. And I still, I almost wanted to hit this person in the face. They looked at me and said, that was a really great show, but what do you have in mind for next season? And I'm looking at them like, you wench, like I literally just showed my collection and you're already asking about what I have planned next. I realized like this is a path that wasn't winnable. Um, it was, it, you know, it's for some, but not for all. But what I really, really, really loved was the media attention and the production of the show itself, like doing the runway shows, putting it all together and bringing that audience to that moment where they were really, um, you know, all eyes on that um, collection. So this was the time of the internet was just sort of beginning, blogs were just taking effect. And I had this idea and I launched a media company called The Fashion List. And you can still go there, the, thefashionlist.com. I launched it and over the next like, you know, eight years, I did nothing but attend runway shows and fashion weeks and write about fashion. And it was an amazing experience to do that. Um, what I saw backstage, front of house, the model castings, et cetera, it was an incredible experience. And at that point in time, I realized that I had now completed the full circle. I had been the retailer, the designer, the manufacturer, um, the media, and I really had this overall global perspective of the industry that few people ever had. I'm sitting in the audience having done every part of the, pu of the puzzle. Um, so I built that uh, up over the next eight years. And one day I was walking down the street, wondering what I was gonna do um, with my life. Cause you know, I, the next thing, I never wanted to settle for too long on one thing. And this person walked up to me and like, Scott, I'm like, oh my God, Karen. And we started talking. And it was an old acquaintance from way back in my lingerie days that um, had a PR company. And she said to me like, you know, I'm looking for, or should we just caught up over the years? And it turned out we had lived like three blocks away from each other for the last like 15 years, which is possible in New York. It doesn't happen in the suburbs that way. You know everybody around you in the suburbs, but in New York, you can know someone in your own building and never realize you live there. And we sort of parted ways and she called me back and said, oh, by the way, I'm looking for someone with a wide range of experience, an entrepreneurial spirit um, to sort of come and help me reinvent, reinvigorate my agency. And I was in the process of getting a master's degree at the time in public relations because I could and why not. And she said, if you know anyone like that, let me know. And I'm like, well, what about me? And she looked at me and said, oh, I never thought of that. Let's get together and talk about this. And I thought that was the blow off, you know, the let's get together line. But what do you know it wasn't? The next day the phone rang and that was on a Tuesday. And by Friday, I'm at a desk and running this PR agency for her. So over the next five years, actually almost six years, I worked at the Brownlee Group, a PR agency in New York, um, doing, bringing all these pieces together, all these parts together. So I was um, you know, working with companies, getting the media attention, planning their events, doing charity galas, producing runway shows, model castings, et cetera, but bringing all of my skill sets to the table to allow you know, them to realize their dreams. And in effort, in essence, I was getting to realize my passions through their exposure. So it's been a great experience. Um, about six, seven months ago, I don't know if you guys heard about this thing called COVID, or not, um, it's sort of been affecting us all in various ways. But um, I realized that after six years of working under someone else's um, umbrella, it really wasn't my ideal scenario. I had dreams, I had visions, I had a difference of opinion about what was gonna be happen post COVID. And um, the owners of that agency didn't share my vision. So I made a buyout offer to them, they didn't accept it. And I'm like, no problem, I, I will leave. So back in June of this year, I left that agency and began my own agency called Very New York, V-E-R-Y and New York. Um, and it was really founded on what I believe to be what um, companies are going to need in the post-COVID era. I brought pricing in line, I brought the representation retainers in line, and I also brought about a very um, 
unusual way, unusual options of paying me as well. Um, and it's been thriving, I must say, over the last six months. And it's really realizing like every, all of my dreams, all of my expectations, are actually exceeding those expectations. So now I'm running a um, PR agency under my own name and still you know, as, serving as editor-in-chief of thefashionlist.com. So there were quite a few other steps along the way there, but that is the, um, the, the, the elevator pitch version of it. And if I had to look at what, what commonalities can I draw from all of that? One is connections, connections, connections. I spend my entire day pulling up connections from my past and utilize them for the, for the present. There's no one I have burned a bridge with. I can call anyone from my past. It's very important to be able to do that. And I still utilize them every single day. I call in favors or call in, you know, assistance. And, um, you know, never burning that bridge is important and keeping the options open. When one door closes, I really, really believe, you know, another five open. And I never am satisfied till I've opened all five and looked through them. Um, I believe you should do everything in life twice, try everything in life twice, because the first time may have been a fluke. And um, you'll be amazed at what happens. So. That's my pathway. Doreen, anything to add there? Up, oh, you're muted. Scott, do you want to hey. share your current? Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. Yes. Can you hear me now? Um, do you want to share your current website and show the students what you've done? Can you do that? Or would um, you yeah, like I think to I can pull it up? The, with the Very New York website or the Fabulous yeah. website? Absolutely. Uh, both actually show okay. us what you show us share. online what you do let's see if i can do that you're gonna see a really messy desktop for one um share let me see here so you're really putting me on the spot here you're, you're gonna embarrass me i'm sorry making me, no making me uh show <laughs> how my my website acumen so here let me go to the fashion list first the fashionlist.com is um, a media site where we I have writers that write for me now. I have photographers that, that shoot things for me now. And we go about covering um, runway collections, whatever that may be. So, um, you know, New York Fashion Week, um, story, I can go into a story deeply. This is one client, Tele Blanc. And then we just write a review of it. And then we post all the photos of it. And we connect people to these new brands. Um, let's see, go back again. And it's just basically a fat, here's a, this one's a little bit racy. This is a, uh, a lingerie, um, a sexy lingerie company that's doing Halloween costumes. So, you know, whatever comes up, we work with them on, um, you know, getting that, their brand's exposure. It tends to be a more trade driven. And by trade driven, I mean the industry really looks to this as well as fashion enthusiasts look to it. And we try to do the stories in more in depth than just like a cursory overview where we actually get more into, and here's one, like this person makes incredible um, masks that are like photo, real photo, you know, face masks. And we get into the whole story about her, what she does. She's a former model. So we talk about that, um, you know, and what, and you know, whatever. So that's the fashion list. And as a result of this, I get invited to tremendous amounts of events around the planet, whether they be in Paris for Couture Fashion Week, New York Fashion Week, London Fashion Week, et cetera. And we have all original photography, all original content. Um, and that's that. That's the fashion list. Any questions about that, Doreen? Or? Um, so the fashion list, I thought, also had all of the, the dates yeah. for New York yeah. Fashion Week. So that yeah, was an, does, that's actually. an important draw. Yeah. Um, in, that's, that's on the list. And right now, if you notice, never just underestimate the power of doing nothing. Well, there's a reason for that right now. <laughs> there's no events <laughs> going on right now. <laughs> However, during a normal um, fashion week cycle, we actually list all the fashion events going on and you can sort them out by industry type women's, other men's and women's media publishing, et cetera. You can choose the season, you can choose the city where it's going on, et cetera. And you can actually build and download a list of events that are going on in the fashion world. So you can click on your runway and you know, search and you get a list of all the runway shows. So that's what the fashion list is. I didn't want to go into that because I thought I was embarrassed to say there's nothing on the fashion <laughs> list right now, but dur generally during a regular fashion cycle, there would be a lot of events going on there. And okay. this is really, this is really for people in the trade. Isn't yeah. that correct? This isn't exactly. for well, consumers. You know, well, consumers can look at it. We do give the, the we give the information that at two o'clock on Thursday, Tommy Hilfiger is showing but that's all you get. 
if you click on the details, then you have to sign in and there's a payment system for signing in. It's only $20 a month. It's not a big deal, but we did that just basically as a gateway because if it's, if it's, you know, someone that doesn't have the need to have this information, we don't give them access and we just to return their money. But if you're in the media, have a reason to have the information, we share that information with you. And then when you, what you get is you get a copy of the invitation. You get the address of the show. Here's the PR company to contact them to get invited. So we give you all the details. So that's what the fashion list is. So it's good. Students can find and research a lot of amazing events and a lot of amazing collections. And then the public um, can you know, learn about all the amazing you know, collections that we're covering as well as knowing a little bit about the events but not all the details because you know you've been to fashion week during you know um it's an insane environment outside the last thing is another 500 people showing up uninvited so that's the fashion list okay and now i can go to the our current venture very new york and very new york is the public relations agency i'm currently um you know i, I recently co-founded and we have one here um a couple, you know, this is like basically, you know, our social media services, events services, public relations services. But we also have something that's quite interesting called very curated. And this is why I'm talking about the new agency for the current the post COVID era. Very curated. Most PR companies and most PR retainers run into the thousands of dollars a month for representation for an agency like mine to promote you to the magazines, the bloggers, the stories about you it would run into, you know, five, 6,000 a month to promote your services. But it dawned on us that there's a lot of companies out there that don't need that huge retainer. They're just doing a good sock or they're doing a great tennis cover or a pair of earrings and we charge them by the item. So this is a way of, you know, here's this um, Luz Ortiz. She's a great jewelry designer. She's promoting these earrings, a little story about her, a picture of the earrings, how to reach her and you know several images of the of the item that we're promoting and this is a way of one for the average fashion fan can discover them and purchase and an editor then we work to pitch this out to the magazine editors to get them coverage in the fashion media as well all for only a hundred dollars per item so Luz pays us three hundred dollars a month because she has three items posted so while it's not the whole kit and caboodle of her as a company. It's these three items that she feels she wants to promote this season. And it's sort of like owning a, a timeshare, if you will, in PR. It's a fractional ownership of a PR company. And in the COVID era where you know, earnings are down, um, futures uncertain, and yet entrepreneurial spirit is quite high, I feel it addresses the, uh, the needs of the industry um, at the moment. And then the other thing that I wanna point out here is very busy. And this is just all of our results. You can see these are all results we've gotten for our clients over the, over the past you know, few months. Um, we worked with Brendan Maxwell. Here's the, in Cosmopolitan. Here's the bag. Here's a bag. Here's the fashion collection, et cetera, the mask I showed you earlier. These are the results. You can click on them and see the actual story that's been posted about them. So you can see what we're up to. It's called Very Busy. Plus, we get into events and everything else. As a matter of fact, we're actually producing an event right now for Albright's Fashion Department. It's a good segue. Um, we're doing, um, as a, as the fashion department at Albright College, um, the senior show or the, you know, the, I guess the graduate show you call it as well as some alumni are being, um, juried and auditioning and we're taking them to New York fashion week to have an Albright college fashion, Albright college, New York fashion week runway show during fashion week in September of 2021. Um, and I'm lucky enough to be producing that event for Albright and involved in the selection process, the coaching process, the casting, et cetera. And there'll be a runway show um, on the runways in New York in September. So does that answer your question about uh, Very New York and sort of what we're up to? That did. So you touched on a couple of things um, specifically that you do. So you, you actually market... Um, a particular brand and you you find placement in yes. other media exactly so that's right. so that's one of your jobs that's right one of our jobs yes like we actually when you see something in a magazine you see something on a blog site you see something on a celebrity or you know on instagram on you know what a graduate caroline Vizana, Vizana is one of the graduates of albright's program she's an influencer at the moment doing quite well all the stuff that caroline wears all the stuff that vogue puts on their pages all the stuff that you know Beyonce's wearing all of that stuff is placed on them by companies like Very New York. 
um, very little of that is of their own choosing. <laughs> it's, um, they're just sort of robots that go through life being dressed by people. And then we, you know, put that item in, you know, we pitch the story in, get the editor interested in writing about it, handle all the logistics of that, get all the questions answered, all the story written, approve the copy. And then when it appears in the magazines, we then report back to the client. Um, and um, if it's on a celebrity, we take that image and then pitch that out to InStyle and Us Weekly and all those type of magazines to get this, the client more attention as a result of that. So that's one avenue of what we do. And the other avenue of what we do is we do the here, our services, we can go over this. Um, sorry, services, here, events, we can go over the events. We cover events. And by events, we do fashion shows and presentations. We do brand activations where it's like on the street or at a restaurant or um, in some way we sort of get people talking about a brand. We also do charity galas and then virtual events. And virtual events are very, you know, um, in vogue at the moment because we can't have the charity gals and the fashion shows, but you know, whether it be a nonprofit or a fashion company, we do their events. We actually plan the entire event, um, even down to selling the tape, selling the, uh, the tickets to the event, gather all the assets or gather all the, um, the money and the fundraising. In the end, the charity gets a check for a million dollars or 1.2 million in some cases, or, you know, 500 depending on the size of the event. And then we get our, you know, we get our money and everybody walks away happy. So that's the other area of what we do. So what do you enjoy doing most? Um, fashion shows and presentations. Um, it's my favorite, followed closely by the charity galas. Um, I really thrive in the events, in the event realm. And, you know, you know I, literally we, we handle at a charity gala, those of you who don't know what charity galas are, it's the way nonprofits make all their money. Um, we'll take over the Plaza Hotel, the Grand Ballroom of the Plaza Hotel, and have a, a seated dinner for 500 to 600 people, which they pay $1,000 to $1,500 a seat for the dinner. And they come there and they get to treated to like this year, we had Kenneth Cole, Ralph Lauren, um, Brendan Maxwell, Bravo Project Runway, and um, I'm trying to think of the fifth one. Um, oh, Alibaba Group from uh, the Alibaba.com come in. They accept the awards and they speak. So it's a networking event within the fashion industry. The American Apparel and Footwear Association is the organization that we put that on, event on for. And they basically pay us a fee to just do that for them. And they collect the money at the end and walk away. So we handle everything for them. It's more turnkey. Same as you know for a designer under fashion shows and presentations. We actually, you know, put on, I think you were at this show during, if I'm not mistaken, sitting in the booth next to me, literally every single model cast, every single dresser backstage, every single person in the audience and every single photographer there, music, lighting, whether there's light coming in the windows or not, we control that entire environment for them. So this particular designer was Marcel Ostertag from Berlin. Marcel um, arrives, you, I love Marcel, yeah. Marcel arrives in New York with the clothing and he has a show because we handle everything else for him. So, you know, I really enjoy this environment. And that, that 15 moment, minutes of, you know, insanity is my favorite part of my job. And can I put a plug in for our students who were working behind sure, the scenes? I, a lot of them were backstage. <laughs> like, yeah, you were up here in the booth right here next to me up here looking down on it, but I've, you know, right. We have a ton of students, and as a, as a, you know, we go out to all the fashion schools. Obviously, Albright being our first choice because of our relationship, but students get the opportunity to come and work these events. Some of them work the front of house, which is where they handle seating people, showing guests in. They actually get to watch the show. Others, I mean, believe it or not, we have students sitting in the front row as seat fillers to get people, you know, hold the seats for certain key people we know are going to run late, etc. Then there's other ones working backstage as dressers, so they get that experience of working. Um, with us and get to experience fashion week from a side that you don't get the full picture of working front or back. Um, and what I like to do is if they volunteer two years in a row, I put them out front one time and back of house one time and they get to see the whole thing. What so. a great experience. Really good experience. Yeah. I hope we're back to this um, very soon because yeah, trust, New York trust Fashion me, Week. Yeah is a moment it's an experience like none other and there used to be a time when you could feel it in the air in new york it's not as much so now because it's happening so far downtown but um you know, new york fashion week is an experience unlike any other and it truly is a magical you know week of of um in insanity but very very magical in so many other ways
So, so I want to encourage everyone to ask questions. We yeah, do I'm have a, stop sharing. <laughs> we do have a uh, question from Trinity, and she asks, "What advice would you give for finding internships or just making connections to the industry?" You know, it's amazing. Ask. <laughs> I got it. It's like students are so afraid to ask. I got today an email from someone that found us on our website, hit the contact us, and sent us in a resume. We're most likely going to we'll at least talk to her. So I would encourage you to first do your research. I love it when people contact me and have no idea what I want to do, what I do, and they want to work for me. I'm like, well, you know, why are you wasting my time? Um, and I'm very blunt about it. I just tell it like it is. Like, you're actually wasting my time and no thank you. So for one, do your research, be prepared. Um, don't be afraid to ask. And, um, you know, make a professional concerted effort of a properly written cover page, even though it's not a cover letter anymore, it's properly written email body, attach your resume in a PDF or easily downloadable format um, with no typos, no mistakes and ask. And if you don't hear back, ask again, don't hear back, ask again. Eventually when I see somebody ask me three times or four times, or usually I'm pretty good about answering the first time, but if I don't, um, I'll let them know and say, I'm just, it's just not for me or do it this way or contact this person. I give an answer back, but you know, be persistent, not a nuisance, but still be persistent. Um, I always use this one example. This is a true story. Someone, a student from another school contacted me and asked me one time, listen, I suddenly found myself able to be in New York for the summer. And I, you know, I want to know an internship. How can I get one? What do you suggest? I told him, I said, go to 557th Avenue, weasel your way past the security guard at the front door, dress really well, and go floor to floor. Why 550? Well, 550 is where Oscar Larenta, Calvin Klein, Ralph Lauren, Donna Karen, they're all in that one building. I said, right now it's late. And I said, invariably someone couldn't get their housing together or couldn't get their act together. There's an internship available somewhere. So just go in and volunteer to sweep the floors. I said, that's like a joke, but go in well-dressed and say, I'll even sweep the floors. If someone's willing to say that, there, there, someone will hear you. He's like, okay, great. So I saw him at the end of the, at that day. I happened to run into him on the street that day. And David came out and he says, you're never going to believe what happened to me. I said, what? So I went upstairs. I kept to the sixth floor. It's Oscar Lorenz's studio. I walked in with my portfolio, showing all my sketches with a resume, looking like I looked. He was in a nice suit and tie and said, um, I will even sweep the floors. And the person said, can you sketch? I said, yep, I can sketch. Have a seat. She came out about 10 minutes later and said, okay, can you come back in one hour, um, exactly one hour and be ready? He left. Came, he, that's when he saw me. He went upstairs. Um, I saw him. He said, well, you let me know tonight what happens. He called me that night. He said, I got upstairs and I was shown to a desk next to this big giant table and said, when he hands you the sketches, pin the swatch on them, erase the extraneous marks and pass them to the, to the, to the designer to your right. She's like, what the heck is going on? About 10 minutes later, in walked Oscar Lorenta, sat on the table next to him. Oscar was sketching, and he tossed the sketch to David next to him. And David would pin the swatch on, clean the sketch out, and pass it on. And he looked, Oscar sort of looked at him, another sketch came. The entire summer, he was Oscar's sketch collector, all summer long, at the, at the foot, feet of Oscar Lorenta. They went on to all their life until Oscar passed away. We're in very close contact. He got a job there after school all on the courage to ask and present themselves in a professional manner. And that's all it takes. You can never get anything if you don't ask. The only way to guarantee failure is to never try. And what's the worst? I always say to students, what do you have now? Nothing. What are you going to have if they turn you down? Same thing. <laughs> ask. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. The, and the last thing about it, don't ever expect to be anything more than, you know, the copy runner, the photocopier, or cleaning the floors be pleasantly surprised when you're more okay and make sure you're the best coffee runner exactly right make sure that yeah. if you if do it really well good, yeah andre leontale who some of you may know andre leontale uh, tells a really good story about he was um, a, you know a very early african-american in the business back when there was very few placements for african Americans in the business but he got a job as anna win out of college as anna win and i'm sorry diana vreeland's office and he was her you know, coffee getter, okay? That's what it came down to. And she gave him a job and his friends criticized him. Andre, you're better than that. Why are you, why are you being her coffee boy? She treat you like her slave. He's like, but I'm getting coffee for 
Diana Vreeland. I'm meeting everyone in the entire fashion business all day long. He went on to be, you know, editor at large of Vogue magazine and very, very well, very well received. And now Sri Lorenzo started out as the pin picker rubber for Balenciaga. Because Balenciaga liked to throw pins on the floor, Oscar would go pick them up. And his people said, you're better than that. He said, yeah, but I'm at the feet of a master couture all day long. Like okay. it served him well. So you're, now, nothing's too good for you. And don't ever think it is. Nothing's Thank too, you. nothing's below you. So go on. We have another question. Yay. Would you say that in order to establish a successful career in the fashion industry, uh, you need to move to New York City? <laughs> it, it depends what you want to do. <laughs> That's a real, years ago, there's no question that that was the only path, okay? It's not so much so any longer, but you've also got to be very aware of what a, sorry, I'm getting a phone call, turn that off. Um, you got to be very aware of what fashion career path you want. I mean, there's fashion in every city in America if you're willing to work the jobs available there. Um, if you are tied to somewhere in America, some geographical location, and you want to be, you know, you're tied to Iowa for whatever reason, and you want to be a master couturier, it ain't happening. Okay? And as long as you can accept those facts, that's okay. But if you're willing to work in retail or have a tailoring business or do bridal, you can work anywhere in America to do that. So I think it's very important to understand what's available in the area and understand too what you want. And then there's no doubt whatsoever that moving to New York can give you a jump start, but it's not the only way. And if you want to work in the juniors market, the young men's market, LA is the place to be. Fast mm -hmm. fashion, you know, Koreatown in LA. Um, Levi's and Nike and the technical sportswear, that's Portland, Oregon and, and San Francisco. So it's not all together just in New York any longer. But if you want to be in high fashion, in runway fashion or in, you know, in the upper echelons of design um, at that certain level, that's the place you have to be, period. And you actually have an office on the West Coast. Yes, actually, Correct. yeah. Now, since COVID came along, I, we realized that there's no need to be so New York centric any longer. So I actually, Mai Vu, my partner, if you go on the site and look at the team, you'll see Mai, she moved to get back to California. And actually, we just got two clients today signed on because of the fact that we have an LA office. Mm -hmm. um, they like the fact that we have someone, on, you know, boots on the ground in Los Angeles. So, you know, that's working to our advantage. Now, if it's some company based, you know, if we didn't have a New York office, that could hurt us. But having an LA office, that helps us. By having just an LA office, that could, you know, that would hurt us a little bit with certain types of companies. But again, there's fashion everywhere. Um, you know, you go to Ohio and work for the Limited. You know, Boston has, you know, where is where all of the manufacturing for um, Men's Warehouse happens. There's there's work everywhere, but you just got to be comfortable with what work is available there. I love the advice that you give to students. If you had to give one piece of advice to to student undergraduate fashion students, what would that be? Never ever sleep, okay? I mean that, it's like if you, I, I was amazed at people that, you know, would crawl out of bed at noon and go to classes and come back and blow. There is so much to experience out there. You've just got to, as a fashion person, as a fashion designer, as a fashion merchandiser, you've got to keep your eyes open all the time. And just whatever opportunity presents itself, seize it, take it. Um, I'm always blown away when I offer like to the Club Vogue people to come up to Fashion Week each, each season and like five of them do and the other 20 don't. I'm like, I get it if it's an economic situation, but honestly, if it's an economic situation, I'll buy your freaking bus, bus ticket. You know, let me know, it doesn't matter. Just take advantage of every opportunity that presents itself. And also, I hope you all have a bad internship. And I mean that in a good way, in a very nature. If you have only ever experienced good things in your life, you're not going to deal, know how to deal with adversity. And students complain to me and say, oh my God, they made me do this. And I can't believe they're making me do this. I'm like, what are you complaining about? Now you know how not to treat someone. You've learned that. Look on the positive side, understand the lessons in front of you and never ever shut a door, close a door. Make every single connection count. Send a thank you note to everybody you meet. Um, just you never ever know what that next connection is going to bring and um that's my advice don't don't uh don't ever rest for a moment just suck it all up because the moment you get out of school you don't have anywhere near the opportunity for exploration you do during your in school it's life changes and, and other things take take a you know take precedence over 
just the exploration for exploration's sake. And as our students are, are told by our career services office <laughs> that they need to build a, build a presence on LinkedIn. Yeah. Is there, and I know you're familiar with that platform. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give any suggestions as to what they should include, what they shouldn't include? Well, I'm going to take it one step further. LinkedIn's important from a professional standpoint, but keep it professional and don't get overly social on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is very important. As a matter of fact, I've found my number one client I have right now, the most the highest retainer I have in my agency came to me on LinkedIn and I, answer, I happen to answer a direct message on LinkedIn and there I have them. So it's a very vital place for business, but you've also got to understand you are a student at the moment. So having a platform on LinkedIn is important, but I really think it's more important for experiencing things and not necessarily building your profile. I don't truly care you know, and I, I'm allowed to say <laughs> whatever, right? Yeah. I truly don't <laughs> care that you're a student at Albright. I don't care you're a student anywhere. I just truly don't. You're not really important to me on LinkedIn as a student. However, you as a student, there's a lot of people on LinkedIn that are important to you because they can provide you with what you're looking for. Whether that be an internship, advice, an inspirational message, or, you know, a possible job interview. It's very different. So don't think that you need to provide content at LinkedIn, but I think you need to you know, be on LinkedIn experiencing it. I think that as a student, what's really important is your social media platforms, such as Instagram, um, you know, Twitter, Facebook, those type of things, not nearly Facebook as much, but really Instagram is vital. The very first thing I do when I get an internship request or an interview, I go look at their, their Instagram. First thing I do, look at their Instagram. Um, because if I see them, you know, I, I always say, if I see you, you know, at home every night, sitting in bed with your, you know, pet chihuahua named Taco, you know, wearing matching skirts, eating Dunkin' Donuts every night, watching reruns of, of you know, um, Golden Girls or whatever, at, versus seeing, you know, student B out every night at a current art gallery, you know, maybe not, maybe not, you know, eating at the finest dining restaurants, but in the right neighborhoods, shopping. To, who am I going to pick? Seriously. It's it, the person who might have the straight A's, but, you know, sitting in bed with their, their, their chihuahua named Taco eating in their squirts, or this person out living life who may be a C student. I'm thinking the C is out living life because that's what I want. I don't want to. So be really cautious what you post on social media. It says a lot about you. But also, I, I encourage you, don't do the BS thing of buying a whole lot of followers. And I look and say, okay, 180 followers, no problem with that if you have you know, 25 likes, but if I see 10,000 followers and 25 likes, oh, I know what you're up to. There's very little transparency. There's very little secret. It's all transparent. Um, and the whole thing about having your secret accounts, that's total BS as well. It takes one, as long as it takes me to type your name into um, an ID checker, I can get behind your secret accounts. So be very, very cautious what you put on your social media because it's, it's, um, it can be a real noose around your neck. So keep your social media accounts clean overall, keep them professional, keep them interesting and engaging. And, um, you know, and be, if you put that on your resume, be very certain that it matters. I don't really care about your boyfriends and your girlfriends and what you ate for lunch. I don't really care about that. Um, don't suggest I look at your account unless it really is, you know, important for me to look at. I'm going to look at it anyway, but if you're putting that out there as what's representing you, it doesn't play well bad news. So understand what social media platforms are for and foster them from as early as you can to be to work to your advantage. A lot of students search for internships by looking for ads mm -hmm. for, in, you know, internship wanted. And mm -hmm. um, what what we try and teach students is to really find out where you want to be and then and go, go after yeah. that. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, the thing I always say about ads, ads are fine. You can answer the ads. And if it's that dream, look, you, you go on there and you see, you know, Rebecca Minkoff, design intern, you know, on freeinternships.com or whatever the current site is, intern, intern Queens one that I, I used to use all the time or list on all the time. But keep in mind that every single fashion student on the planet, include, and even non-fashion students on the planet are looking, oh, Rebecca Minkoff, ooh, I bet I'm going to apply for that one. Your chances are next to nothing of getting that. And I mean, you know, I would say that from anyone. It doesn't just matter. Parkinson's, Albright, Kent State, it doesn't matter. Any student, just the numbers, there's a numbers game. 
I look at it much more, I'd rather be wanted than just be one of the, of the many. So I want someone that actually takes the time to search me out, find me, present a meaningful case for themselves, whether that be a resume and a cover letter, and then apply. I'd much prefer that. So I think that that's the much more intelligent and much more flattering way to go about it. And once again, what I say earlier, if you don't ask, you're never going to receive. So go in there and, you know, and ask for what you want. And you might just get it. Okay. So I, you know, do both, but put more emphasis on the, on the research. I just want to remind people that they can put questions in chat. Um, nothing is, nothing is off the board when it comes to Scott, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yep. Yeah, I'll say, any, well, I'll, I'll answer anything. I have a question for you and the fashion industry is absolutely changing. It's changing all the time. It's not just the apparel, um, it's, it's the industry itself. And how do you see things changing because of COVID? How do you see um, brands marketing differently? How do you see a difference in, for, in manufacturing? Yeah. What is changing because of COVID with fashion? I think that it's, um, uh, never been a better time to be someone new at the moment. Um, I just think that right now everyone is discovering people, everyone's discovering products on an even playing field. They're not going to Macy's, they're not going to Bloomingdale's, they're not going to Bergdorf's to, to shop. They're, they're just not, unless they're insane. So they're actually discovering them in a digital platform. And when on a digital platform, while, you know, Mark Jacobs can do something really fancy with some fancy movie or, um, you know, so-and-so can do something this way, you're all still seeing it on this little computer screen in front of you. So you have a real opportunity if you present yourself in a quality manner as, an, as a manufacturer with a really, really good photograph and the old iPhone, you know, 10 and above has unbelievable cameras to them. There is no excuse whatsoever for not having a really, really good presentation online and you have equal opportunity to be discovered. And I think that just during the New York Fashion Week back in, when was it, uh, September? Um, I will tell you, I represented two collections. One was Tale Blanc, T-H-A-L-E, B-L-A-N-C, taleblanc.com. And the other one was um, Negris Labrum. Both of them got incredible press coverage and their fashion shows cost them next to nothing because they did them all in a digital format with like two models walking back and forth and, you know, in the case of Deborah in her living room, in the case of Travis at her abandoned um, retail space. And they did these great fashion shows and they were on there right next to Tommy and Ralph and all these people right on the same platform playing with these exact same, you know, presentation size, the screen. And they got amazing, you know, opportunities. So what's changing? The discovery mechanisms are changing majorly. Um, I also think that right now pricing is vital. Um, I think that the really, really high priced um, options just aren't as cool any, any, at the moment. They're just not. There's no need for it. People right now, what, look at what we've seen. You don't know what I'm wearing from here down. You know, and Doreen, I know that you told me you're in a, a grass skirt right now. Yeah. So we don't know that. So, you know, we, it doesn't matter. This is what's important right now in the fashion world. So a good brooch, a good scarf, a nice right. t-shirt. Statement t-shirts were all over the runways this season because why? Right here is the branding. Prada's thing with a big Prada logo right here is going to be a top seller. Why? It's a way of getting a brand, making yourself feel good about yourself. You can order a t-shirt online comfortably. You're not buying an, you know, an evening dress. And it's a $150 way of getting a piece of Prada instead of the $8,000 way of getting a piece of Prada that you're not going to be, no one's going to see it anyway. So I think the pricing structure, what's important right now, and the mechanisms for delivery are all important or have all changed at the mm -hmm. moment. So, and if, and if we don't capitalize on this right now as a young new designer, it's going to be very, you're not going to have another opportunity like this for a very long time. So we, we do have another question. What advice do you have for those of us who are interested in owning our own business? We have a lot of entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, work for someone else first, no matter what you do. I mean, I came out of school and worked for the Republic for a while, worked for four years while I figured out what I wanted to do. And then I, um, you know, got a, got myself in a position to, you know, start my own, my own collection. But the lessons I learned working on someone else's dime were, were invaluable. 
And I did internships all four years while I was working in retail. I did, went into retail, realizing I didn't want to be in retail any longer. I scheduled myself for late nights and weekends to keep my weekdays free. And I interned at companies. I hand sewed in a bridal salon. I um, worked on doing photo shoots for someone. I did all kinds of stuff, just exploring it. Um, so learn on someone else's dime, write a business plan, save as much money as you possibly can, and never use your own money to launch a business. I, <laughs> I've never launched a business yet on my own, on my own dime. I think the very New York is the first one I launched on my own, on my own capital. I found investors in everything else I did. Um, the fashion list, I was an Albright grad. I was someone who's two years behind us. He went on to be a, sell a couple companies and I pitched him the business plan and he, he funded it. Um, my first two businesses were funded by, you know, much bigger corporations that, that wanted a, an upstart division. I utilized my connections to make that happen and to, you know, meet those people, but I never used my own money. So my advice, learn what a business plan is, learn how to write them and get a job working for someone else. Understand what it is you want to do and make sure it's what you want to do. I thought I wanted to be a chemistry major. Then I thought I wanted, I thought I wanted to work in chemistry. Then I thought I wanted to um, be in retail. Neither one of them was right. And I ended up owning an internet company and still own one. And when I was in college, the internet wasn't even a thing yet. So it's like, you, you never, you really have no way of knowing right now what you want to do. So get into business, experience it for a while, learn it, make those connections. Because then when you do start that business, you can call on those connections, get on the phone, get them in there to support you or help you along the way. But going it right out of college is the biggest mistake you could ever make, period. Don't do it. You will regret it and you will fail. You will fail. <laughs> okay, and that's just the odds. It's not me being a naysayer, it's just the odds. Make your mistakes on someone else's dime. On someone right? else's dime, exactly right. <laughs> Even if you get fired for it, the worst, you didn't, you didn't lose your life savings, you just lost a job. Make your mistakes That's elsewhere, right. okay? But it's vital because it, it's like I was. You you only have one chance to you only have one chance to be new, and if you go out there, you know, Michael Kors was on his fifth or sixth incarnation, the one he's currently in. People don't remember the first five times he failed. Mark Jacobs has been in and out of business multiple yeah. times. He failed multiple times. Those stories you hear that and say, "Oh, I can fail multiple times." Yes, you can, but it's not as easy anymore because now you have something called social media. You have something called the internet. Nothing's forgotten any longer. In the old days, when you had a, uh, the story ran in the newspaper, four days later, that newspaper was in the bottom of the birdcage. It didn't matter any longer. That story's forgotten. It's not that way any longer. Failures last a lot longer they did today than they did years ago. So, you know, make that mistake, make those mistakes somewhere else. And then when you come out on your own, you can say, ah, designer from Ralph Lauren, designer from Calvin Klein, designer from, you know, upstart, whatever now on his own or on her own, it's a bigger story, a much more important story. Then you have the gravitas of that label behind you as well. Even if Michael Kors is furious that you left him, you still have the experience and the, and the, you know, you can ride, you can ride on his coattails a little bit. You don't have that experience coming right out of school. Nobody cares. It's not a new story about, oh yes, recent grad from Albright starts a collection. Who cares? So. Good advice. <laughs> Honestly, good advice. Um, but a lot of our students today, I would say the trend over the past couple of years have been students that are actually looking to start their own brands. Uh, you can, you reinforce, can do that. You can, yeah, go on. Sorry, go on. I was going to say, you reinforced my, my advice to them, and that is make your mistakes on someone else's design. Keep that idea, you know, keep the flame burning, but go out, work for another company, make some connections. I mean, the best thing is when you go to work for someone else, you're making a lot of connections. Mm -hmm. If you are doing your own business, you're not necessarily out there making those connections. Yeah, one thing I forgot, to, I didn't, I negated from my initial story because I didn't want to you know, bore you with too much um, minute was I got a job for six months working for a Chinese silk um, company that made like a, a collection of silk designer sportswear. We sold to Saks and Bergdorf's and all those big name stores, but they were from China. And I, I, well, I, I don't know if I should say this. The admissions host should keep their ears shut. And Doreen, you don't ever acknowledge hearing this. But I lied. I made up a resume. I lied about my resume. Lied about a portfolio. I made up a lot of BS to get this job. 
I made this stuff up though, knowing that I could do it. There's a difference between lying your way to something you can't substantiate. I just didn't have the experience doing it, but I actually had the, I knew I could do it through various internships, et cetera. But I got myself in this job and I knew that I was underqualified for the position, but I knew I could learn it quickly. And I literally came in there first day thinking of nothing else, I'll sweep the floors. And I literally cleaned the office every night. They would go home at night, I'd sweep all the floors. And what I do then, I went to the photocopier, I got everybody's Rolodex, I got their connections, I photocopied the Rolodexes. Um, and slowly over 26 days, I had all the Rolodex of the designer copied. I would just soak it up, I volunteered, I'll go there, I'll go do that, I'll do that. No matter what it was, I ran the errand. While I was in that building, I went floor to floor for the building. Button suppliers, feather suppliers, this supplier, ah, cutting room, gathering cards, I went. I did all that on someone else's dime, knowing full well that the moment I had all that information gathered, I was gonna leave and start my own collection, and that's what I did. So I left Banana Republic, did this for six months, and then left, but that six months was probably the most vital experience I could have ever had because it was doing exactly what I wanted to do. And I had all of those connections under my belt because, you know, it's, it, people say, oh, isn't that underhanded? No, it's not underhanded. Uh, it, it's, I was, I legit, legitimately ran the errands. If I took the opportunity to get off the elevator and ask someone a question on my way, that button supplier could have helped that designer as well. You know, I just happened to get two cards, one from my office and one from my pocket. Um, it's the way you do it. So. Once again, like six months, I was running the place as well. Every phone call came in for me because I ran every errand. So it doesn't take long. Got your name out there. I <laughs> got my name out there, right. <laughs> um, can you speak a little bit to um, an, a, um, a liberal arts education? Mm -hmm. You started off with a liberal arts education. Um, yeah. You didn't go to FIT Parsons. No. Can you speak to the benefits of that? Sure, and this is not just because of um, I, I work with I work with Albright. I went to Albright because I'm actually on the staff right now at Parsons at Parsons School of Design. I was an adjunct professor there. I teach a class in importing and exporting there. I don't think that that is the right path for me and the right path for many. And the reason is fashion is an incredibly diverse skill set, from inspiration imagery to inspiration. I, ideas, the ability to communicate your message of the collection verbally. And today you got to communicate via a 140 or 180 character tweet, an Instagram post, a Facebook post, as well as a blog post, as well as the big story, the small story, et cetera. You're talking to media all day long. You've got to be able to communicate well and you got to have reference points along the way. And I will tell you some of the most incredible classes I had had nothing to do with fashion. Um, they were non, non-Western religion was one of the classes. Um, you know, I, at the time I'm thinking, why do I need to know this? But now like with the whole world situation and traveling in the Middle East, um, while I was working, um, you know, sourcing my, my lingerie collection, I understood what sh the difference between Shinto versus Muslim versus Buddhist. And I had all that to thank from my educational background, not a pattern making class. You know what I mean? So I think in today's world, especially in design, and especially in fashion where your reference points are so diverse and so varied. Having a diverse, broad-based background, and a, a, I'm an expert of none, but you know, uh, I, I under, oh, very, very, what do you call it? Expert in nothing, but a generalist, a general, you know, I can speak a little bit about everything, is vital. And there's very few conversations that I can't pick up on in any dinner conversation, any cocktail conversation, or regardless of what the conversation is, I can't have some reference point and I have a liberal arts and an insatiable curiosity to thank for that. And it's vital. Um, you know, especially what I do now as a writer for the fashion list, going out and seeing, I, you know, there's you no know, what I pick up every collection I go see, I look at that design brief, there's an inspiration statement there and it's, it's invaluable to have that, that diverse background and math, 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 math. Okay, it's, it's incredibly important. People say, oh, I have a computer for it. But if you can't put that cost formula into that Excel spreadsheet, nothing will come out of it's worth it. You must know how to write, 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 and do math. You will not succeed pretty much in any business, but especially in fashion. Thank you, Scott.
Nobody is happy to hear that. Trust me right now, but it's so true. I, I know, <laughs> but it is. We give you a, a broad communi- a broad-based education where you learn how to communicate and you can learn how to teach yourself and reinvent yourself. Those are some of the good things about a liberal arts college. Yeah. Um, so I just want to put in a plug before I say thank you. And that is our next fashion discovery event is December 3rd at 7 p.m. Our guest speaker will be Kyle Breadbenner. Oh, Kyle's he's great. From, from the West Coast. He's <laughs> zooming in. Kyle is currently visual merchandising manager for Swarovski. And with that, I really want to thank you, Scott, for being here with us tonight. It's always a pleasure. Um, it's wonderful to see you again. And um, let's just keep in touch. Okay. Will do. And thanks for my, my Chris Dillon and Eddie Schmidt for joining some classmates of mine. I don't know how they got onto this, but they're there. So thank you, Doreen, for asking me. Anything you, ever, anything you ever need, let me know. And if any students want to contact Doreen and have any questions, feel free to email them to me. Yes. I would send them to me and I'll forward them to Scott. Sound Excellent. good? Thank okay. you so much. Excellent. Bye-bye, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you for attending. <laughs>